Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Pastor Killingsworth from First United Pentecostal Church of Grosbeck, Texas. I'm so thankful that you have chosen to join with us this evening in worship. May the Lord richly bless you.
Luke chapter 9. And I want you to notice the time frame here. Verse number 24, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. And then shall they come, and then he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you the truth, there will be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Verse number 28, and it came to pass about eight days. Everyone say eight days. Eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and James and John and went up into a mountain to pray. And he prayed, and the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory. And this is, Luke gives us this, and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. So we see this, uh, just a slightly different rendition uh, from Luke's gospel. Now let's go over to the book of Mark, chapter number 9. Mark chapter number 9, and we'll read just a little bit farther down the same text, verse number 7. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man anymore, save Jesus only with themselves. <clears throat> Verse 14, And when they had come to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question you with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit, and whithersoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. Everyone say, they could not. And he answered him, say, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Luke says, faithless and perverse generation. Mark just says, faithless. And they brought unto him, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him. And when he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming, he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it has cast him into the fire. Everyone say, Into the fire. And into the waters. Say, Into the waters. To destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus saith unto him, If thou canst believe, say it with me. All things are possible to him that believeth. In verse number 27, Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind goal can come out by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Let's pray together. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word, and thank you, Lord, for your people. Help us, O God, to put context oh god on our condition and help us lord jesus to see transformation during our transition we bind every resisting spirit whether human or demonic and we pray that your perfect will will be done tonight help me to speak as an oracle of the lord let everyone who is watching and those who are listening here tonight let everyone be blessed and brought into a new dimension in jesus name everybody say in jesus name Turn to three, four, three or four people and say, the Lord bless you real good. And then you may be seated. <laughs> there, are th there are certain themes in the Bible that we go back to. There are principles of the Word of God that constantly speak to us. We can share the gospel every single day, and it's relevant every time. Because every time we share the gospel is for someone that needs some good news. They need to know that there's a second chance, that they can be born again. And so even though you may have heard the gospel a hundred times, a thousand times, there's something that's rich and powerful every single time that you hear it, and every single time that you study it, and every time that you research it. And so... 
there are certain principles of the Word of God that have the same kind of effect because they are tied in with those deep themes of redemption and salvation and deliverance. And one of those themes is transformation. Everyone say transformation. It is a part of our mission statement. We say honor God or love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Honor has a sense of respect to it. It has a sense of the fear of God. It is not just a casual, well, I love the Lord. When we say honor God, we are saying put Him first, make Him your priority. And then our second, our second uh, uh, s sentence or words are love people because God has loved us so unconditionally we want to reflect that by this shall all men know that you are my disciples and that you have love one toward another so so he is saying that this is discipleship on display is love being being shared one to another not just one for another but one to another if i have love for you it's something that's in my heart when it's love to you it's something that i manifest so we are, we are wanting to manifest the love of God by our lifestyle, by our actions. But then finally, we have something that is supernatural, something that we want to create the conditions for by honoring God and by, love pe by loving people. We want to create the conditions so that we can be transformational, to transform the world. So this is something that only the Holy Spirit can do. But we apply the Word of God to our lives. We allow His Word to penetrate deep into the layers of our, of our soul, into our hearts. And there is where uh, we begin to have a change in the way that we think. So that thinking then begins to be like its own, its own covering in our lives. We begin to have the mind of Christ. We put on the mind of Christ. And then we, we begin to have a different attitude and mentality and identity, how we view ourselves. We view ourselves the way He begins to view us. And so through that process, there is a manifestation. There is a way that people can see, as the old song says, Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. And so this is what we're after. We're after a transformation. There are some things that we, we maybe are, are concerned about that are not going to change. You know, the Bible says the Ethiopian can't change his skin color and the leopard can't change his spots. Some things you have to accept. But there are other things in our lives that absolutely we can expect the Holy Spirit to deal with us about because they are designed to be like God. We were designed, so we were actually going back to our original intent. We are being transformed back into His likeness. How many want to be like Jesus? Would you lift your hands to the Lord right now? Would you tell Him that just for a minute? Say, I want to be like you, Jesus. I want a transformation in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so these are lofty and great ideas. But then we ask the question, yes, but how? Everyone say how. How does this happen? So part of why we study the original text is because when we get down to the original text, you get, you get more meaning from the words. And if you want more meaning, you have to ask more questions. So we, we ask more of the text to get more out of it. One of my, one of my uh, uh, favorite examples is, is Pink. If you were to read Arthur Pink in his commentary on Hebrews, he will have volumes and volumes on just one verse because he, he asks so much more of the text. I've read other commentaries that skip whole, whole portions of the chapter, and they would say very little in the commentary. And I'm, th I'm thinking, is this a, is this a commentary? At all, because I, I thought there was supposed to be more that you're going to give me. So w when I come to the text, I want to get the most out of it. And so we, we ask more of the text. So the first question that we ask is, is this word transformation, when has it been used? And what is its original, what is its original context? What does it actually mean? So the word transfiguration is actually the same word, transformation. When you see, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed that is the same greek word as jesus when he was on the mountain and he was transfigured it it, it is not just to change the surface it, the bible talks about satan who can transform himself into an angel of light that is a different transformation 
That means to disguise yourself or to put on a disguise. It is to say, I'm going to change the outward appearance of something to hide you from what I really am. But transformation in the context of Jesus is showing us that it is the revealing or the exposing of who we really are. It is the exact opposite of what Satan does. Satan creates environments to make us think something so that we will believe something, but is, that is not actually true, that is actually a lie. God, on the other hand, does a work in us to bring us to the truth, to take away all the layers of misconception and lies that we have been trying to battle through so there's all these things that Satan puts on us to try to tell us about ourselves and we see this in the world system that's why the Bible says be not conformed there is a conforming there is a feeling of of, of non-importance or that we are all average we are all the same we are all just being reduced to a number the mark of the beast is going to reduce everyone to a number that's it you will have no identity beyond your number. You have no value beyond your number. It is to dehumanize people, to take away any sense of, of desire for greatness. The reason why there are so many laws right now of taxes is to keep people in a place where they will not have a lot of options because it keeps the players that are on the grand scheme of things a, a limited few of people. They don't want new players that are on the stage. They don't want new money because that means that someone else they have to deal with that might change the plan it's the reason why everyone was so upset with Donald Trump coming in because it plan it changed the plan we have a nationalist and everybody else on the grand scheme are globalists and so he comes in and starts speaking nationalist thought processes and you're interrupt we don't need that we don't want that so we have to find all the ways to demonize him because he's disrupting the system folks this is a, a good picture of, 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 of what God is is trying to tell us right now is that Satan wants everybody to just fit in this bland benign do nothing don't achieve anything don't become anything but God did not design you that way God designed you with a purpose he designed you with a plan and he designed you to, to be more and to be better and to go to the next level to go beyond where your parents brought you to go beyond where the generation behind us brought us we are supposed to stand on the shoulders of those giants that were before us and see a little farther reach a little farther do a little bit more and ask God for more things Elijah said you're asking for a hard thing when when Elisha asked him for a double portion it was because that was as far as he could see is what he was able to do in his lifetime but Elisha had the foresight to understand that he was starting where Elijah ended and he did not want to repeat Elijah he wanted to go beyond Elijah this tells us how we should really think when we have transformational work of grace in our lives that we should always be saying okay God but what are you gonna do for me but what going to happen in my life I know what you did yesterday I know what you did with our elders I know what you did with our foundation and wow aren't we blessed by what they gave us but now God it's my turn and what am I going to get to do and where are we going to get to go together you have to look at who God is calling up a mountain Peter James and John three fishermen He's calling up the mountain. And Moses said, show me your glory. And he had to wait 1,500 years to come and appear in, a, in glory in the mountain. And Peter, James, and John can't even read and write, but they're up there with Moses. Elijah is there with Moses. They, they, they lived their lives with anticipation and hope. They saw it in the spirit, but could not experience it in their lifetimes. And God gave them, God gave them a gift by letting them appear in glory because they represented the law and the prophets. They were representing the fulfillment of Christ's role of, of, of completing the Old Testament and fulfilling the Old Covenant. And yet here's Peter, James, and John, and, and they're about to sleep through one of the greatest events that ever happened in the history of the world they were heavy with sleep they were tired climbing that mountain and somewhere in the middle of all of this excitement Jesus's garments change his face is shining bright like the Sun and the Bible says it was it was eight days 
since he told them that there will be some standing here that will not perish till they see the kingdom of God coming. Eight days. Everyone say eight days. So this is our season of eight, our season of new beginnings. And he was saying, I'm going to do something new. I'm going to do something that the world has never seen before. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to take you to a place that you've never been before. I'm going to let you experience things that Moses and Elijah wanted to see. And, and their prayer is finally getting answered now. And what's the litmus test for being on the mountain? Certainly not being educated. What's the litmus test for being on the mountain? Being perfect? I think there was people that probably lived and operated and functioned in, in a higher dimension of, of, of law-abiding uh, a law-abiding lifestyle. The, the Pharisees, they were paying tithes of mint and of anise and of cumin. I mean, they were taking their spices when they would get them uh, from the market, and they were paying, uh, paying tithes from their spices. I, I got four basil leaves, so I'll take a quarter of a basil leaf, and I'll give that to God. Tithing. So what is it? What is it? It's the fact that they were walking with Jesus, that they had a passion for Jesus, that even after they had already known him and had revelation of him, they were not satisfied with what they had. This is where we have to understand is the, is the principle of progression in God, is that you can never be satisfied with the experience that you have. You can never be satisfied with the revelation that you have because there is always so much more that he wants to give than what we have already received. Is there anybody here tonight that says, God, I am hungry for you. I am more hungry for you than I am for anything else. I have more desire to know you. I have more desire to be with you. I want to be in the presence of the Almighty God. I want to know you, Jesus. Lift your hands to the Lord. Close your eyes for a moment. Lift your hands to him right now. Tell him. Hallelujah. I've used this template for a long time. I've used these, these, these stories for a long time. I've preached on this before. But there's something that you can go back to and you can extract because there's always things in the text that we miss. And we miss them because of the timing. We miss them because of the timing. Some things we are not mature enough to grasp. There are questions that the, the disciples asked Jesus at the end of their walking with him that they had not thought of when they first started walking with him. There were questions that they asked about the end of the world. There were questions that they asked about his coming. There were questions that they asked, and you read, John, you read, you read um, Matthew 24, and, and they, they start asking questions. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? They never thought to ask Jesus those things. Yet Jesus knew all those things when he began. And he could have told him. There's a lot of things that we could be asking Jesus that we do not know what we don't know. This, I think, is probably one of the things that terrifies me the most is to think of all the things that he could be telling me right now, that I could be asking him right now, ways that I could be growing, that I could be more effective, that I could advance in, in this world today and help the gospel to be preached to more people to establish the kingdom of God. And yet, if I don't know what I don't know, I can't ask God to tell me. And so it just, it just says, it says to me, I've got to stay current in my relationship with God. I've got to stay hungry, and I've got to keep walking with Him. There were other disciples that stayed at the base of the mountain, and for whatever reason, Jesus did not see enough hunger in them to call all 12 up, or even some of the 70 up. He just called three up, because these three were the ones that He knew He could always count on to be hungry. God cannot feed you if you are already full. You cannot go any higher if you have no desire to ascend. If you feel like you've got everything that you need, then you will not have that same passion, that, the same desire, and that same, that same unlocking of truth and revelation and, 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 and study of the Word of God because you feel like, well, I already know that. I was talking to a lady on a plane one time. I was trying to, uh, to see if there was any any room for me to share another level of revelation. 
The Bible talks about the way more perfectly. And I know sometimes there's a lot of people that have faith, and they just need a, a, just a, one more step. They just need one more insight, and that might push them into that next level where they can really receive the full measure of grace that God has for them. I was talking to a lady on the plane, and, and I was just saying, isn't it great when God can reveal more truth to you? Isn't it wonderful? I said, I learn things every day. And she just looked at me with the most puzzled look, and she said, well, once you know the truth, what else is there to know? And I thought to myself, that woman will have a hard time getting past where she is right now. Because she was so content with the tiny little sliver of truth that she had. I'll tell you what's happening to me. The more I study, the more that I dig into the text, the more that I find, and the more ignorant that I feel. I had a, uh, uh, an elder many years ago. His name was Kenneth Reeves. And he, he told a vision that he had. God took him up into a, into a, a cave. Uh, it was like a heavenly cave. There was like there was angels that were there. But in the cave, there was all these drawers that looked like, like libraries. And it was from the ceiling to, to the floor. And they had all of these rows and rows as far as he could see. He, he, th there were these rows and rows. And, and he pulled out one of the drawers. And he pulled out a book from the, from the drawer. And he opened it up. And he read one sentence. And he understood that one sentence. And he tried to read the second sentence. And he could not understand it. He just, he just stared at it. And the angel turned to him and said, That's all you know. And God was trying to show him that compared to all that you could know up here. Compared to all the volumes and volumes of information. What you know is equal to about one sentence. Oh God. Give me a passion and a desire to climb that mountain. Is there anybody here tonight that says, God, I want to climb that mountain again. I want to go be with Jesus. Part of what we are doing this week in fasting and prayer is we are setting aside everything else. And we're giving up our hunger for food for our hunger for God. And we're saying, God, there are some things that are more important than my lifestyle, than the things that I always do, and the way that I always live. You see, we can always eat, but we can't always fast. We can always fellowship with each other. We can always sit around the table. But there are times when God sets it aside to do a new thing in our life. That he says, is your hunger for me? You see, we have to replace it. You don't just go without food. You have to say, but I'm hungry for something else that is more important. I am hungry for God. I am hungry for a revelation. I'm hungry for a change in my life. If I stay the same way that I am it's just another year but God if you can work on me if there can be a transformation that can happen in my life then I can come down to this mountain and I can do something that is meaningful and worthwhile in this dark world God will take time God will take time with us to get us in that place of transformation he will spend the time to change us. He's building men. He's building women. That's what he's building. Think about this. Think about this. Two men went into a city and turned a city upside down. When it was, when it was Barnabas and Saul and then Barnabas and Paul, everywhere they went, they turned that city upside down. Just two men. How many thousands of believers are in this city? How many hundreds of believers are just in Pasadena? What is it going to take? How many is it going to take for our city? Is it the volume of people? Or is it the quality of the change? Is it the amount that are, that are there that are praying? Or is it the level of faith and revelation that they're operating on? Is it, is it how many people that they had praying with them that were in Antioch? Or was it the church in Jerusalem that was supporting them? Or was it the fact that they had such a consecration that when they would walk into a city, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus? So to me, this says, God, I've got some more changing to do. I've got some more transforming to do. 
I have got to do something to, to go to the next level. And so Jesus had to show those disciples at the base of the mountain their lack in order for them to be motivated to go to the next level. When he comes down from the mountain, and Peter and James and John had seen him, and yet he told them, don't talk about this. Don't you tell anything that you've seen today or that you've heard today until after my resurrection. And they're like, what's the resurrection? What are you talking about? So, well, it hasn't happened yet, so just be quiet. And so they're walking down the mountain, and they're like energized. Man, I saw that. Jesus, how did you do that with your face? That was really cool. I mean, his garments, they changed. I, I, wow. And did you hear the voice? This is my beloved son. Hear him. They were still, it was still echoing in their minds. And when they come down, there's a multitude of people that are frustrated. There's a mul multitude of people that are asking questions that have no answers. The disciples are frustrated. They're looking at him like, well, I'm glad Jesus is finally back because, man, this has been a tough one. I mean, they were trying to cast the devil out. They, they cast devils out before. This was not their first attempt at casting out devils. Jesus had sent them out before, and they healed the sick, and they raised the dead, and they cast out devils. They came back celebrating. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said, don't just rejoice because the devils are subject to you. Rejoice because your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Celebrate because you're going to heaven. But this time, Peter, James, and John go up in the mountain. Now there's something in the valley. And they're trying to cast him out. And they can't cast him out. They're frustrated. They bumped up against something that they simply could not whip. Is there anybody in this room? You don't have to raise a hand. Is there anybody in this room that you can look at your life and you can say, man, I've had success here and I've had success there. But it seems like I bump up against something that I can't quite get past. I can't get through this. And I know it's demonic. And I know it's a, it's a barrier. I know it's a wall. And I'm having a hard time getting past this. Do you think that maybe God might be trying to explain something to us? Oftentimes we internalize it and think there's something wrong with us. Or the other option is we doubt God. If we're not doubting ourselves, we will doubt God. And we will wonder if God really can get us through this situation. That's what was happening to the boy and to his father. He was saying, if, he was saying to Jesus, if you can do anything. When you, when you start talking to God in if, you lack revelation. When you start talking to God in ifs, it means you lack faith. If you are talking to God and if, if you can do this, God, then that means you haven't been with him long enough to really know that nothing is impossible with God. But sometimes you have to come to an impossibility in your life before you can discover that he can do it. God has to many times bring you to the barrier so that you will cry out and ask for more. Sometimes God has to bring you to the end of your faith so you can know that there's a dimension beyond where you are. Sometimes God has to get you past your satisfaction so that you can find out that he wants to take you to a dimension that you've never been in. But if you didn't have the hunger, and if you didn't have the failure, and if you didn't bump up against something that you couldn't overcome, then you wouldn't have never known that there was a higher place to climb to, enough for you to have the desire to want to go there. So God sometimes allows these things in our lives that create frustration because he is saying, if you'll be hungry, if you'll have some, if you'll have some passion I will take you to a place to show you myself on another level because you cannot be changed until you see me better we are changed according to the degree of revelation that we have of Jesus period you want to be changed it is 100% 100% based on your revelation of Jesus Christ. 
the greater your revelation of Jesus, the greater the transformation. That's it. You want to be better? You have to see the one who's perfect. You want to be healed? You got to get a revelation of the healer. You want to be delivered? You got to get a revelation of the deliverer. You want redemption? You got to understand the cross and your redeemer. If, if you want to have direction, you've got to have a, a, a direct line to Jesus Christ, who is your wonderful counselor. Oh, God. Oh, God. Let me never tire of the, of the thought or the pursuit of knowing Jesus. Would you stop again, and would you just lift your hands to the Lord right now? Press your way. Sometimes it's hard climbing. Sometimes it's hard climbing. But here's what it comes down to, folks. They were exhausted in the valley. The ones that didn't climb to be with Jesus, they did not exhaust themselves trying to climb the mountain. But they ended up exhausting themselves trying to cast the devil out that wouldn't come out. So you choose where you're going to spend your energy. You can spend your energy on problems you can't solve and situations that you want to handle by yourself without Jesus. You can try to solve life and solve those, those barriers and overcome those barriers and say, I've got enough, I'm okay, it's not necessary, it's not essential. Or you can say, you know what, if I'm going to spend my energy on something, I would rather spend my time and my energy climbing this mountain to go and be with Jesus. The Bible says they were tired when they got to the top. But when they woke up, when they woke up, they were in a new dimension. And you might exhaust yourself trying to pray and fast and push to go to a new level, but I guarantee you that you will wake up in a brand new dimension and you'll be seeing Jesus in ways you've never seen him before. And you'll be hearing voices and experiencing the presence of God. I want something to happen in our church where we can be reignited with our hunger for Jesus, where we have a passion for him, where we have a desire for him, where it's not just a story, it's not just a thought, it's not just a belief system it's not just a doctrine but I have an awakening of my revelation of him where I can walk with him and I can hear his voice is anybody hungry to know Jesus to, to walk with Jesus to hear his voice in your life hallelujah hallelujah the, the disciples asked Jesus what's wrong with us Oftentimes when, when we bump up against problems that we can't figure out, that's what we say, what's wrong with me? That is the, the condemnation that hits us. That's the accusations that hit us. Something's wrong with me. Something's wrong with me. How come I wasn't up in that mountain? Something's wrong with me. How come I couldn't cast them out? I, I, I sit in Jesus' name. I, I did what I was told to do. What's wrong with me? Jesus just looked at him and smiled. Nothing wrong with you. This kind takes another level of consecration. Prayer and fasting. Up to this point, you have to understand, Jesus never taught his disciples to fast. Matter of fact, the disciples of John fasted often, and they came to Jesus and said, how come your disciples don't fast? And he said, as long as the bridegroom is with you, you're going to rejoice. When he's taken away, then you're going to fast. So what Jesus was actually doing was giving them a prophetic experience. 
And he was giving them the tools for their future. He was saying, I took care of this for you. I was showing you that I'm more than enough. That even when you have reached the end of your of yourselves and you think you can't, I still can. Even when you are using what I've already given you, the tools that you've already had in your hands, you're going to come up against something in the future and you're going to find yourself frustrated by something. But I just want you to remember this day that even when you thought I couldn't do it, I could still do it. Even when you thought it was impossible, it was not impossible. It was just another level of consecration that I was calling you into. And, and you are able to function now. Now, and guess what you're gonna be able to function then on the same principle just keep walking with me and keep consecrating yourself to me prayer and fasting there are no shortcuts I wish there was I've heard people say well I did my one fast you know <laughs> I wish you could just do one fast and that would be it, you know, never have to fast again. I wish you could just have one, one book of prayers you could read and everything you would ever need would be downloaded in that one book of prayers. I have it all now. I can do anything now. But such is the nature of our existence that you whip something today and you go to a new level and a new level will bring a new devil. Be careful what you want. You might get it. <laughs> oh man, I want to walk in a place with God where I'm just fighting devils all the time, where the demons are just, you know, attacking me because of my spirituality. <laughs> I just can't wait for the day when I've got so much anointing. People are just calling me 24 hours a day asking for prayer. I just want to have so much anointing that when I walk down the street, you know, folks, you know, it's wonderful. All those things are wonderful. But guess what? When you get in those dimensions, it's like people that want to be famous. And then they get famous, and then they disappear. They are trying to find some secluded place. They can't go out to eat anywhere. They, they, they can't get on an airplane anywhere. They can't go on vacation. I mean, it doesn't matter where they are. I mean, they're going to find them. They're going to see them. People are going to be taking pictures. Oh! There he is. Woohoo. A lot of famous people wish they weren't famous anymore. I know a lot of preachers that have some popularity that wish that they, that they weren't under a microscope every, every, every 30 seconds. Sometimes it's a gift when you don't have everything that you want just right now. And you have to learn to just walk with God and say, God, let me learn and let me, let me be happy and let me be content just being with you right now and learning and growing. But remember this, even in the times when you reach that frustration point, he is bringing you to a, another lesson to teach you that I'm never going to leave you without an opportunity to be equipped for the next level. He said, I haven't taught you about fasting yet. I didn't teach you about this dimension yet. I took care of this dimension but I let you see a little bit of frustration so I could put a seed in you that you would say I always need to keep growing I always need to keep moving forward with God and the next dimension you're gonna learn is I'm gonna go away and my physical presence is not gonna be here but my spiritual presence is gonna be here I'm gonna be in you with my Holy Spirit and you're gonna know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world and I will not leave you comfortless I will come to you then I'm gonna teach you how to fast and then I'm going to show you how to break down the strongholds. I'm going to show you how to go back up in that mountain in the spirit. I'm going to show you how to get fresh revelation. And I'm going to show you how to bring it back into the world and bring people out of their darkness. And I'm going to teach you how to do the impossible through my spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Stop and lift your hands again to the Lord right now. The word transformation or transfiguration is the word metamorpho. It's where we get the word metamorphosis from. He's talking about stages. Stages of growth and stages 
of change. We transition. You start as a... <laughs> if you use the butterfly as an example, you start off as a little, little popa. Just a little worm that just has a propensity of eating everything that's green. If it's green, it's mine. I'm just going to eat that thing. And then that thing just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. And man, all of a sudden there's little things sticking out of its back. And man, all it can do is say, I just love green stuff. Just, just show me green and I'm after it. I mean, they, the leaves, they are eating those leaves. They are consuming those leaves. I mean, man, that thing just, and it has a built-in, it has a built-in camouflage so that the, the birds don't eat it. And nothing else doesn't want it. And, and it just keeps there eating until finally something happens to that full, fully developed pupa. It goes into its, its full stage, past the larva stage. And all of a sudden now it's full caterpillar. And then it suddenly gets real sluggish. And says, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm not ready. I don't want to eat nothing. I've eaten all I can eat until I have a change. I've, I've gotten as much as I can get out of this stage. I've grown as much in this stage as I can grow. Now I've got to have a cocoon. And out of that same caterpillar comes... The cocoon that it spins. There is something inside of the caterpillar that triggers. There's a, there's, a, there's a mechanism in them that says, time for the next level. And all of a sudden, after all of the consuming, it puts something out. It produces something. It creates a cocoon for itself. And then it submits to the process. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to do much. And it's just there sometimes for weeks, sometimes for months. But something amazing is happening where we cannot see. And all of a sudden, that thing wakes up. I, I remember one time I got a cocoon. I didn't know what it was. And I was so excited about it. And I took it into the house. And I just broke the stick off. And I just put it in a jar. And I stuck it in the house all through the winter time. And I was just waiting. I was waiting. What was it going to be? And what was going to happen? And then I forgot about it. I would shake it sometimes. I was like, man, I don't even know. There's something in there. And I stuck it. And I just let it down. I'm like, oh, I don't want to hurt it. So I just left it. And one day I came home from school and my mom was so mad at me. She goes, what on earth was in that cocoon? My God, it's a moth. It's a giant moth that's flying around the room. Where did that thing, did you bring that cocoon into the house? Oh, it was a moth. Oh, awesome. That was so awesome. It was a giant moth came out of that thing. And my mom was trying to kill it, you know. She didn't want that thing in the house. So I don't remember what happened. I think mom won. I think mom actually won. But, <laughs> but I didn't know what it was. I, I, was just, I was just enamored with the idea. I thought that thing just sat there. And I didn't think, I, I totally forgot about it. It seemed like it was completely dormant. But even, folks, in our times when we think that we're completely dormant, God is doing something inside of us. And what happens? There's, a, there's something else. It's a timing issue. It's a timing issue. It's a readiness issue. See, both of these things, the Mount of Transfiguration and casting out the demon, they were about the future. They were about where you're going. They were about a transition into a new dimension. It was about transformation. Jesus said, I'm showing you what transformation looks like. I am transfigured in front of you. Now you're going to do that. Prayer and fasting, prayer and fasting, revelation of Jesus, exposure to his presence, soaking in his word, prayer and fasting. And all of a sudden, there's something in you. There's a trigger in you that says, push. All that time, that, that butterfly is inside of that cocoon. It doesn't do anything until the change is complete. And then something inside of that, of that cocoon says, 
I'm not supposed to be here anymore. What is it? I, I don't know. How does, how does it count? Does it count? Is there a little calendar inside of there for a, little, for a tiny little a calendar that the butterfly is counting? And 28 days is when I'm going to come out of here. And it's been 27 days till tomorrow. No, no, no. It's something inside of the caterpillar that says it's time. And when is your time to manifest? When is your time to go to the next level? It's something in you that says, oh, God, I have got to get out. I have got to go to the next level i am hungry for a change i cannot stay the same anymore i i cannot stay in the same cycle i cannot stay at the same stage god i've consumed all i can consume on this level god i, I feel something in me i've been waiting I, i've been i've been in this process of change it just seems dark but there's something in me that says now 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 And that butterfly will push, it will push against the walls until there's a small hole at the bottom and he will push his way out. They say that if you help it come out, it won't be able to fly because it gets his strength to fly from the push. Folks, God is not going to help you through some things because he needs you to be a part of the process. And the push is what gives you the strength to go to that next level. It's what gives you the faith to say, yes, I can do this. Yes, I can go to that next level. Yes, I can. Yes, I will. God, you put something in me. You put some greatness in me. You put a destiny in me. You put, you put, you put a dream inside of me and now it's time would you stand with me all over this building so this is our metamor that is this is our metamorpho this is our metamorphosis this is our time of of transformation this is our year our year of pushing through, our year of breaking through the doorway, breaking through that dimension, that wall that we've come up to, now God is turning it into a door. Things we've been waiting on for a long time, we've been asking God for a long time, and it just seemed like we came up to it and we couldn't quite do it didn't quite have the faith Jesus what's wrong with me no, no 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 I'm putting the seeds of the next dimension in you I'm putting the seeds of transformation in you I'm unlocking the the map I'm unlocking the pattern inside of you Paul said my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you until Christ everyone say until 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 he said you're you're already born of the water and born of the spirit you're already begotten you're already the people of God you're already heirs of the promise but there's still more Christ that needs to be formed. It's the same root word for transformed till Christ be formed in you. He's saying, I know that there's more ministry. What, 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 is, what is Christ? Christ means to supply what's needed. Greek word for Christ, to supply what's needed. It means to rub or smear with oil. <laughs> Thank you for letting me pick on you a little to rub or smear with oil that means you've got so much anointing is Christ was the anointed one and we become the anointed ones Christ is formed in us and people do what they did with Peter and John they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus been with Jesus I want I want to be educated I'm asking God to help me learn three or four languages I, I there's I said God even with my age of my brain please can you do something can you give me a pass and let me go back to where it's more pliable I can learn better and help me to learn language I 
want to be intelligent. It'd be wonderful to be a doctor or whatever, doctor of divinity or whatever. But you know what? What I want more than anything, I want people to know that I've been with Jesus. I want people to know I've been with Jesus. Do you see him in my face? Do you hear him in my voice? Do you observe him in my lifestyle? Is his nature the same as my nature? Am, am, am I like him? Do I have the same level of faith? Can I do the same things that Jesus did? When I stand before a crippled person, do I look at him and go, oh, oh I, I wish Jesus were here? Or do I say, thank you, Jesus. Your spirit is here right now, and you can bring healing to this body. I want to see the blinded eyes open and the deaf ears unstopped and I want to see drug addicts being instantly delivered and I want to see people come in off the street and get freed from their from their pain and from their sorrow and from their past and and get and get filled and changed and transformed and what he wants is he wants all of us to be a reflection of him And so there's a travail. Paul said, I travail in birth again until. I just keep travailing. I keep going through the process. I, I, I pray. And during my prayer, something else is birthed. I travail. I travail again, and something else is born. I travail again, and something else is changed. I go on another fast, and during that time, I learn something else. I get another dimension. God shows me something else. He takes something out that doesn't belong and puts something else in his place that does. Does that make sense? So that's what he's doing right now. The warfare in 2017 was about our process of change. This year is not about so much about the process of change, but it's about the manifestation of who he's made us. That's where the fight's going to be. The fight's going to be whether you're going to be able to release it, whether it's going to be able to come out of you, whether you're going to have confidence, whether you're going to accept the change, whether you're going to keep the change. Are you ready? Lift your hands and turn them towards yourself right now. Say, God, I submit to this, to this place of change that you put me in. I submit to this season of transformation. I submit myself, God, to this process. <laughs> oh. God. Oh, I can feel the pressure, God. I can feel the pressure of the walls, God. I can feel the intensity, oh God, of the confining of the cocoon. I can feel that, that frustration of saying, I, I want to be more, but I don't know how to be more. God, I can feel that sense of, yes, I want it, but I don't know how. I hear that voice, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me, God? And you're saying there's nothing wrong with us. But you're ready to take us to a new dimension of revelation of who you are. Because the sufficiency...